Uh, dear colleagues and friends, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on which place you are joining us from. I'm honored to welcome you as the chair of the International Water Association Specialist Group on Sustainable Coastal and Estuary Development to our first webinar for this year on tidal energy opportunities and challenges. So the main objective of our specialist group is to promote sustainable development of coastal reservoirs, tidal basin technologies for water and energy security, waterfront development, including coastal protection works across the world's coastal regions. I'm sure you probably are aware that at present around one and a half billion people lives around the world within 30 kilometers of coasts, predominantly <clears throat> in sea. This is expected to increase, but our coastal areas are experiencing major sustainability challenges. So late last year, our specialist group is first webinar, we focused on coastal reservoirs for sustainable water supply. And today in this second seminar, we will focus on power of tides and in particularly harnessing tidal range energy. I'm looking forward to actively participating in today's webinar and I hope you are too. Let's propel forward tidal energy technologies from the sea, ensuring a cleaner, greener tomorrow. I'll now pass it on to our moderator, Professor Teo, to provide more information on the webinar and introduce our two distinguished speakers. Over to you, Professor Teo. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Siva Kumar. So hi everyone, I hope all of you are well and uh, staying safe. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening to our esteemed speaker, uh, Professor Siva Kumar as the chair of I, uh, IWA, as well as our member of IWA and all the participants from uh, wherever you are. So welcome to our International Water Association Special Group on Sustainable Coastal and Estuary Development Webinar Sessions. So this is my honor to be the moderators for these sessions. I am Fang Yen Tio from University of Nottingham, Malaysia. Together with me, Professor Mutu Kumar, Kumaru Siva Kumar from University of Rongong, Australia. And uh, the last pandemic has brought together us, uh, you and me, uh, and the world closer through the online platform. So this is why today we have this uh, webinar and also we are going to discern to a very interesting technical topic sharing on tidal range energy, particularly on the opportunity and also the challenges. So our speaker here, uh, our guest speaker, both from United Kingdom, UK, which is Professor Roger Falconer from Cardiff University and also the Miss Cat. G. Martin from the CEO of British Hydropower Associations. So the webinar focuses on tidal range energy in UK as well as uh, globally. So this webinar is organized by the IWS Specialist Group and the webinar is one of the best platform for sharing our knowledge and also experience to ensure successful imp implementation on sustainable uh, coastal and also engineering uh, developments. So the webinar aims to offer insight, best practices and experience related to solving global water challenges by promoting sustainable coastal and estuarine developments, coastal reservoir, tidal basin technologies for water and energy security, as well as for the urban and agriculture development across the world coastal regions. So I think without the further ado, I would like to invite our first speaker of today, but anyway, I would like to give you a, provide you with a brief introductions where Professor Roger Falconer, which is the Emeritus Professor of Water Engineering at Cardiff University and also the an Independence Water Consultants in United Kingdom. He has spent over 40 years of specializing in research and engagement in over 100 hydro environmental monitoring studies for tidal energy, flood risk, and also the water qualities. He's also the recipient of many awards. He's also the fellow of UK Royal Academy of Engineering and a foreign members of Chinese Academy of Engineering. He was the president of IAHR, which stands for International Association of Hydro Environmental Research and Engineering from 2011 to 2015, and now the vice chair of IWA Specialist Group on Sustainable Coastal and environment developments. He has been heavily involved in many tidal energy projects 
and Rose since 2000 and has published uh, and presented extensively in the field, this field of engineering. So without further ado, I would like to invite Professor Roger Falconers to give us the, the talk on this topic, which is on the title range energy opportunity for the West Somerset Ragoon case study. Professor Roger Falconer, the floor is yours. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you very much and it's a pleasure and honor to be here. I'm gonna focus more on opportunities today. I come from Wales and everyone in Wales has B positive blood and therefore it's appropriate that I concentrate on the opportunities and um, we will discuss the challenges perhaps later. So I'm going to talk, my talk is in two halves. I'm gonna focus on work on the Seven Estuary and Bristol Channel to start with. And then I'm going to talk briefly about a project I'm more recently involved with called West Somerset Lagoon. So let's first remind ourselves of the need for tidal energy. I know that many of you will be familiar with the key issues, but just to remind you in case you're not familiar with them. We have climate change. We face significant population growth, a very big topic in the current elections in the UK. And this is going to lead, both of these two issues are going to lead to increasing energy demand. And on top of that, the UK is planning to um, reach net zero emissions by 2050. So we have a big increase and a big change in our energy production over the next 20 or 30 years. We, uh, tidal energy is predictable. We can predict it to 50, 100 years in, in, in the, into the future. We can't do that with wind. We don't know how much wind we're gonna get tomorrow. Solar energy is wonderful in the summer, but in this country, we need, we need solar energy in particular in, in the winter months. So tidal energy should be a very major part of the energy mix, in my view, for the UK, and particularly since it's predictable. And I'm going to focus in particular on the Seven Estuary, which in the UK, which has the second highest tidal range in the world. The peak is about 14 metres tidal range, and it's four hours out of phase with tides along the northwest coast of the UK, therefore complementing one another. There are two types of tidal energy generation. <clears throat> tidal stream, uh, which is where you put a wind turbine effectively in the water column. And the power here is proportional to the cube of the velocity. What I'm gonna focus more on is tidal range schemes, which basically capture the potential energy, the water level difference either side of an impoundment, and the power is proportional to the planned surface area and the square of the tidal range. So if I just look at two key points here, tidal stream versus tidal range, and the point I want to make in particular is that these are not in competition with one another. They actually complement one another. So for tidal range, we need a large tide, tidal range and a minimum depth. We don't want to be building embankments in deep water. We have barrages which span an estuary and usually a large river, like the Seven Barrage, for example, which I'm going to talk about shortly. And we have lagoons which cover part of an estuary usually and may enclose a small river, but not generally a large one. In contrast, tidal stream are, as you can see in this picture, they need large currents and they need deep water. So generally you're talking in terms of looking at a minimum of 30 meters of water. So the next bullet point at the bottom, last but one, so generally these two complement one another. In the Bristol Channel and the Seven Estuary, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, you would not be thinking of putting tidal stream turbines, whereas you would be looking at tidal range. The next point that I would like to make is the tidal range technology, current technology is predictable. We had the Laurence Barrage was built in 1966. It's been in place now for nearly, for nearly 60 years, over 50 years. It's worked very efficiently over that period. 24 turbines, six sluice, sluice gates, and according to what's quoted in the literature, pass, passage of fish without much in the way of major problems. This is a small barrage, but nevertheless, it provides us with the evidence that tidal energy, tidal range energy uh, is a proven technology. Now I'm gonna focus on the Bristol Channel and the Seven Estuary, where, which is west of London, about uh, 200 kilometers west of London. And here we have the second highest rise and fall of tides in the world. The tides are generated at the continental shelf and they are amplified as the tide comes into the Bristol Channel. So this is the area where we have particularly high tidal ranges. We have very strong spring tidal currents 
I suspended particulate matter and we have on various occasions when the conditions are right, the SEM bore propagating all the way up to the tidal limit at, at Gloucester. Now back in 2008 to 2010, the British government, UK government, uh, Department of Energy and Climate Change commissioned studies to look at the most effective way of capturing energy from the Seven Estuary. And five schemes were considered in some detail, including a SEM barrage along the line shown here and various lagoons such as this Newport Lagoon. So there were three lagoons, uh, so, sorry, three barrage sites and three lagoons. The barrage has the advantage in many ways that it impounds a very large area. So for example, the SEM barrage line here would impound 500 square kilometers of land upstream. And if you recall, the tidal power is proportional to the plan surface area. And that would be equivalent to Lake Geneva, for example. Uh, also barrages offer you the opportunity for significant flood reduction upstream and address the impacts of sea level rise or can address the impacts of sea level rise. On the other hand, the Seven Estuary and the Y Estuary up here are major fish migration rivers and fish migration through a barrage is not quite so straightforward as with a lagoon, for example. And also there is Bristol Port up here. Um, you can't see it on this map, but Bristol Port is here and this is the main channel. And of course, any ships coming into Bristol Port would have to go through massive locks with a barrage. So this was the original seven barrage proposal by the seven tidal power group in 1989, which consisted of sluice gates and locks, turbines, 216 bulb turbines and sluice gates on this side too. It was uh, considered in some detail between about 1990 and 2000, 2008. Uh, it, it's based on using bidirectional, uh, sorry, bulb turbines. These now are double regulated and can uh, look at, uh, can, can model uh, flow in both directions, but the turbine itself is not symmetric. Uh, the turbines can be operated as pumps and can reduce the intertidal habitat losses upstream. The turbines generally have three blades and can be double or triple regulated. These are the turbines that are currently being considered in most of the barrage schemes and lagoon schemes that have been considered in the UK to date. The problem is uh, with the original proposal, this STPG scheme, it was based on the concept of ebb generation only. These turbines, the bulb turbines, were originally designed for unidirectional flow through dams and so forth. Here you can see the computationally predicted flow coming through the sluice gates and then on the ebb tide generating power through the turbines in the center part. The problem with this approach, ebb generation, is that you can considerably reduce the velocities. And here you can see without the barrage and with the barrage and a significant reduction in the velocities. This estuary has unique characteristics in very high suspended sediment levels and the sediment is roughly proportional to the cube of the velocity. So if you drop the velocity considerably, then your suspended sediments drop enormously. And here we have the situation with ebb generation. So ebb generation, we have high turbidity. The, arguably the ecosystem is suppressed, um, but when you build your barrage, then the suspended sediments and the turbidity levels drop dramatically. The argument that some will make is that this is much more productive in terms of ecology. But, uh, and, but the question is, what type of birds will we see, for example, will we shift from dun into seagulls and so forth? I have had many explanations given to me by friends in organizations like the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds. And it has become clear to me that we need to do everything we possibly can to protect the high suspended sediments and turbidity levels in this estuary, because this is what makes this estuary unique. So currently we have moved away from ebb generation only, which is shown on the left-hand side here, and shifted towards two-way generation. There are many advantages in two-way generation. That means you generate on the flood tide and on the ebb tide. Instead of sending one significant pulse to the grid, you send two pulses to the grid. And you are also producing energy over a much longer period of the tidal cycle. So there's only two to three hours typically where we're not generating power with two-way generation, whereas with one 
ebb, ebb only generation, only on the ebb tide, we have periods of typically eight hours when we're not generating. So I'm now going to talk about two-way generation. More recently, <clears throat> I was encouraged actually back in 2008 to, to look at the design of a turbine which could deliver energy in both directions symmetrically. And that uh, encouragement came from the RSPB. At the same time, Rolls-Royce were working on a turbine. This is the sketch you see here, which is totally symmetric. But now this has been looked at in much more detail by Jacobs, a major international, one of the leading international consulting companies worldwide, and a Semnesri Tidal Bar. They've recently been awarded a large grant of 0.9 million uh, to look at the design, build, and test new VLH turbines. So it's a very exciting time to be working in tidal energy with new technology coming coming along in the, in the very near future. This turbine has the advantage it will, it will produce energy over a much longer time span generating at peak efficiency. The blades rotate slower, making it um, less stressful to marine life and less impact on the surrounding hydro environment. Um, when I was at Cardiff University leading a fairly large research group, we also explored the opportunity of turning the bulb turbines around every alternate bulb turbine in the opposite direction. And this allowed us to ma almost maintain the existing high currents in the estuary. At the same time, a, a company was developed, which I was closely involved with, Havrim Power, and they were looking at building a project with 1,026 VLH turbines. This is the new type of design that we are talking about in, in terms of what uh, Jacobs and um, SETB, 7 Estuary Tidal Power Bar, are working on. I would like to take you to another point which has helped me enormously in working on the design of lagoons. This is the Swansea Bay Lagoon, which was proposed in about 2010. It had a development consent order, but didn't progress further. And here we see one of the big challenges when this was modeled by my team at Cardiff University at that time. It's now, the team is now led by Professor Razor Amadian. You can see very high currents on the flood tide. The that this consisted of 16 turbines and eight sluice gates. And this generates strong circulation within, within the bay and currents uh, well up above what a normal person would be able to swim against. So it does offer significant challenges in terms of people using the water and, or getting into the water inside the bay. And what we found was that if we, so this shows you the picture of the original design. If we were to modify this and have eight turbines, eight sluice gates, eight turbines, and space it out slightly further, the cost would the cost the increase in cost would be small. But you can see that the wake upstream is dramatically reduced. So if you distribute the momentum of the flow through the turbines and the sluices over a greater wall length, then you markedly reduce the velocities upstream, the circulation, and so forth, and therefore you reduce significantly the risk of um, safety risk to any uh, children or teenagers, for example, trying to swim in the water. So with that in mind, and with other characteristics in mind, I've been more recently involved in the West Somerset Lagoon. The West Somerset Lagoon is proposed to be between a town called Minehead and Watch It. You can see it shown here. It's in the Bristol Channel, and it's outside of the areas of special protection and the sites the site of um, uh, area of conservation. These are protected areas which the NGOs, non-governmental organizations in the UK, are particularly keen to protect at all costs. And that's why we have uh, specifically looked at locating a lagoon outside of these areas. So it's located in the Bristol Channel. It's outside of the SAC and SPAs. It's outside of the main channel. Main shipping channel was up here to Bristol Port and Cardiff Port. A Cardiff port here. And so in theory, the West Somerset Lagoon would not impede any shipping up to those ports. It's a semicircular shape, which gives it the maximum lagoon area. And we need the, the area to be maximized to produce maximum energy. And it's the minimum wall length, wall length thereby reducing the perimeter costs. <laughs> And learning from the Swansea Bay simulations undertaken at the Hydro Environmental Research Centre at Cardiff University, you can see that we've designed this lagoon so that the turbines are well spaced out 
along the Lagoon Wall. There are 125 turbines in five blocks. Concrete, they will be built in concrete caissons and built in dry dock. To, to optimise the design and the operation of these lagoons, a study carried out at Cardiff University using genetic algorithms predicted that 125 turbines would be the best. And this was also used, whereas in the operation of most um, of most schemes, the head, the starting and uh, head for both flood and ebb tides is fixed. In this case, however, those um, those heads have been varied from one tide to the next to give you the maximum energy over the tidal cycle. We've also looked at pumping. So we've had flexible operation and then we've had flexible uh, starting and ending heads governed by the genetic algorithm AI artificial intelligence. And we've also looked at increasing the, the energy generation by pumping at high tide and low tide when you've got a low head. So we generate under high head, but we pump under low head. And this we believe will increase the energy production over the year by typically 18%. We've also done CFD modeling from based on boundary conditions generated at the continental shelf to look at the environmental impacts of West Somerset Lagoon. And here you can see that by full momentum conservation, we can see the wakes being well spaced out along the wall of the lagoon on the flood tide, and very little difference to the to the hydrodynamic characteristics in the main estuary outside of the lagoon on the ebb tide. We've also looked at the impact of the water levels upstream for the future. So here is the lagoon, and you can see here at Bridgewater Bay, Welsh Grounds, and uh, Slimbridge you can see that the variation in the water levels as a result of West Somerset Lagoon is very small. In other words, if at some stage in the future one wanted to build a barrage, for example, then this scheme would not significantly uh, affect the energy generation capacity of a barrage in the Seven or any other lagoon in the Seven. We've also compared the costs. Hinkley Point C is a nuclear power station currently being built in the UK, just downstream, just upstream, sorry, from West Somerset Lagoon. It, it has a capacity of 3.2 gigawatts. It'll last 60 years. West Somerset Lagoon is 2.5 gigawatts and it will last 120 years. And when you do the calculations and take the cost range for Hinkley Point C between 33 and 46 billion at today's costs, West Somerset Lagoon, 10.1 billion. Then you can see over the period of the lifetime of the project, 120 years, vis-a-vis um, -vis 60 years, that the nuclear power is 1.6 times, at least 1.6 times more than the cost of West Somerset Lagoon. And furthermore, with West Somerset Lagoon, it could probably produce energy well beyond 120 years. I haven't come across anybody saying the Westminster Abbey in the UK should be pulled down because it's been up for more than 120 years. So just before I come to my final points, lagoons and barrages for that matter offer you a wide range of other opportunities as well as simply tidal energy, as you can see from this overview sketch for Swansea Bay Lagoon. Oh, no, no, sorry, West Somerset Lagoon. So in conclusion, um, tidal range schemes offer us proven technology to generate predictable renewable energy. And to an engineer, something that's predictable is a very powerful tool. You can control it much better if it's predictable and you can match the energy security requirements. The working, pro the projects that we've talked about here, both barrages and lagoons, have a lifespan of at least 120 years. The turbines may need to be replaced every 60 years, but the wall will remain. Through artificial intelligence, we can optimize the flexible and starting head because we go through the spring leap cycle. We can increase the energy through optimization using artificial intelligence by 8%. Pumping at low head reduces the intertidal habitat losses and will allow us to increase the energy on the subsequent tides by typically 10%. Larger schemes such as West Somerset Lagoon, Sem Barrage and so forth, the energy cost is similar to offshore wind and nuclear, and I would argue probably cheaper. Schemes offer protection against coastal erosion, flood risk and sea level rise, and we're already starting to see more coastal erosion, flood risk and so forth in the UK, as likewise in many other countries across the world. And finally, there are many other benefits to um, a lagoon or a barrage, for example, flood protection. 
So thank you for your interest. I'd like to acknowledge the support of my colleagues at Cardiff University, Professor Reza Ramadian, two PhD students, and my colleagues in tech, tech, Tidal Energy and Environmental Services, Chris Binney and David Kerr. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Roger Fakona, for the very interesting uh, discussions. Especially, uh, we keep the questions from, uh, I can see many questions have been here uh, from our participants. Uh, we keep the question until the end of our session here today. So uh, without further ado, I will also like to invite our second uh, speaker here. But before I invite her, I would like to uh, introduce a little bit about her. So we have the speaker here, which is uh, Miss Kat. Germantin, which is the CEO of Bio British Hydropower Association, BHA, and with a Bachelor of Science in Fuel and Energy, and also the Master of Science in New Renewable Energy, Kat has experience and expertise across all renewable uh, energy technologies, and also a passion for delivering the net zeros. Kat believes that not only is net zeros of strategic importance, in terms of CO2, uh, also saving the climate change uh, mitigations, but also with the increased urgency around the UK energy security added to the pressing requirements to dramatically reduce the cost of energy and elevate the pressures of price shocks. With the years of experience, CAT bring a whole system thinking perspective to our net zero transitions and recognize the importance that all technologies are included in the mix. CAT is pushing hard to ensure that the hydropower, palm storage, hydropower, and tidal range are recognized as the key foundation features of all recarbonized grid fit to all the futures. Without further ado, I will invite our next speaker, uh, Ms. Kat Jemartins. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Professor Teo, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and thank you very much for the opportunity to present today. Um, as Professor Teo said, I'm Kate Gil Martin, I'm Chief Exec of the British Hydropower Association, and I'm going to be presenting on the tidal range energy opportunities and challenges of bringing forward that potential within the UK. So uh, just a little bit about the British Hydropower Association. We are a trade membership association and we're the only one in the UK that solely represents hydropower. And our mission is really to drive growth in the sector by engaging, influencing and promoting hydropower, but also tidal range and pub storage hydro. And really trying to make these technologies relevant within the UK government's ambition, <clears throat> excuse me, to enable a decarbonised secure grid by 2035. <clears throat> excuse me. So, we really focus on what the challenges and problems are and how what policy support we need to bring forward those three technologies. I'll skip over the hydropower pump storage hydro, but in terms of tidal range, we're asking government to bring forward a price stabilisation mechanism and very specifically for tidal range, the regulated asset base, which is used for nuclear. And we feel that that policy support will help enable the deployment of up to 20 gigawatts of tidal range in the UK. So our main barriers for this support, and I would say that political will is key to the enablement of the tidal range deployment in the UK, is the, the main barrier is the expense of tidal range or the perceived expense of tidal range. And for example, the levelised cost of energy for the Swansea Bay project, um, which people use as a reference case. So what can tidal range deliver in the UK? Why is it such a great opportunity? Um, well, as Roger said, you know, we have a huge potential resource in the UK, up to 10% of the world's accessible tidal resource, at least 20 gigawatt potential for installed capacity that could meet 12% uh, of the UK demand. And as Roger said already, it's mature and it's proven technology. It's non-weather dependent, which is really key as we have more and more intermittent renewables as, such as wind and solar on our UK grid. As Roger mentioned, it's a long-term asset. And we know from our hydropower portfolio that hydropower is still operating um, from that portfolio 100 years after it was built. And actually it saved uh, the British consumer in 2022 in the energy crisis, our hydropower portfolio saved the consumer 1.1 billion. So it's <clears> a really <throat> useful long-term asset. It's predictable and reliable. And I think a key point is that it's generation near population densities. And we know that our 
energy demand is going to increase by about, about 2.5 times as we electrify heat transport and industry. So having that generation near those increasing uh, population demand centres is really key. And that, in fact, will help us circumvent one of the biggest barriers we have to decarbonise, which is grid uh, and the grid constraints we face in the UK. So again, putting generation next to demand does help circumvent that issue. It's also a semi-dispatchable power and it offers ancillary service to the grid, uh, GB grid, which is really important as we take thermal plant off to have those um, ancillary services like inertia. And as Roger mentioned, this is really key around mitigation for flooding, erosion and sea level rise. And of course, there are huge benefits in terms of indirect and direct employment opportunities that this could bring to the UK. So where are we up to today? Um, well, previously in 2017, um, there was an independent review looking at the feasibility and practicality of tidal lagoon energy in the UK. And that was led by Charles Hendry. Um, and he would conclude that uh, tidal range could play a really cost effective role in the UK's energy mix. It would help with our energy security, it would help deliver our decarbonisation commitments and would bring substantial opportunities for the UK supply chain. He also stated that it could help deliver low carbon power in a way that's very competitive with, o o with other low, <coughs> excuse me, low carbon sources. However, to bring this forward, it would need a clear long term government strategy in favour of tidal lagoons um, if we were going to benefit from the cost reduction and supply chain opportunities that this could uh, enable. And a quote from the review states that tidal lagoons can be an exciting uh, and important new industry for the UK and we are blessed with some of the best resources in the world which puts us in a unique position to be world leaders. However, unfortunately, in 2017, the government decided not to support the uh, Tidal Lagoon um, Pathfinder project. So what's different and why is this on the agenda again today? Well, obviously, energy security has gone up the agenda uh, in after 2022 energy crisis. And trying to capture the UK's indigenous energy generation would really help enable and give resilience to the UK energy grid. We have to have a diverse portfolio within our energy generation mix that will give us that energy resilience. So not just in terms of technology, but also in terms of that generation profiles and also geographic locations of energy generation. Also these long-term assets give discounted cost to future generations. And really importantly, as we've already mentioned, uh, resource adequacy, uh, solar and wind are both intermittent and they're, give, they're going to be bringing forward a big problem in terms of that resource adequacy and any generation that can be available every day, timetabled and guaranteed is going to be really key to that mix of generation and that reliable mix of generation. In terms of energy storage, for tidal range, we need uh, it's measured in hours rather than days. Whereas with wind, we have the duck and flout, which is maybe up to three weeks of low wind periods, which really needs very long duration energy storage. The grid, as I mentioned earlier, is a really big barrier in the UK in terms of decarbonisation. Um, and we've got huge constraints across the transmission and distribution network. So again, putting generation next to population demand centres is a really key way of reducing the risk around trans transmission constraints. We've got to have a flexible, responsive grid that's stable. And having large spinning mass contributes to grid inertia, dampening frequency functions, which is going to be really key as we take thermal plant off and have more and more intermittent wind and solar. And also it offers really good long-term value for money. And this reduced exposure to energy inflation gives an ongoing reduction in its contribution to wholesale electricity costs in real terms. So Roger already mentioned a lot of the co-benefits, but we ha really have to consider that when we think about the levelized cost of energy, unfortunately, it doesn't include those co-benefits. It's not counted uh, within that levelized cost of energy, which is a really big problem when we have uh, politicians and civil servants comparing different technologies. 
So co-benefits such as onshoring and growth of manufacturing and construction supply chains, um, increasing our skill set and also bringing forward research and innovation, the flood mitigation and reduced cost of coastal erosion, also things like water management through eco-engineering and sustainable construction and growth in eco-services, uh, for example, protection of habitats and wetlands that will deliver biodiversity net gains. So the levelised cost of energy has been a thorn in our side, and it's a very, very blunt instrument that uh, the government use to measure the value of energy generation technologies. It doesn't tell us the value of a stable, operable grid fit for the future. It doesn't give us the end-to-end -end costs that include the lifestyle costs or the transmission costs, or even the costs of constraint and rebalancing or curtailment and storage costs that are associated to wind. However, there has been a shift because as the price of, of offshore wind has come down and down over the years, there's been a, a, a mantra that the levelised cost of energy and this reduction in costs is something that will happen continuously. And actually, uh, in our auction round five last year, uh, no offshore wind was brought through the auction because the administrative strike prices were too low. So that was really a sea change in government thinking around the continuing diminishing costs of offshore wind and energy and renewable energy generally. So what the Tidal Arrange Alliance did, which uh, is convened by the British Hydropower Association, is we commissioned Jacobs to undertake a piece of work that would look at the levelised cost of tidal range. And they use dynamic dispatch models to look at multiple scenarios uh, using what we call the future energy scenarios, which is a yearly published uh, paper that undertaken by the ESO, which shows us different pathways to decarbonize. And what this research showed is that actually using tidal range can bring the cost of energy, the sorry, levelised cost of energy down. And actually it can be comp competitive to both tidal stream and also to nuclear. But using enhanced technologies, a bit like Roger was talking about earlier, it means that actually the prices can come down even further and we can become competitive uh, with even floating offshore wind as well. So this is a really key piece of research that we've undertaken to help government understand the benefits of tidal range and to put it back on the page in that mix of other energy generation uh, technologies. So uh, talking about innovation, Roger's already touched on the fact that historically, uh, tidal range has been developed using bulb turbines, which obviously are used in hydropower, and has the efficient generation on the ebb tide, but can also generate on the flood tide, but, low, but with a lower efficiency. So a key part of work going on in the UK at the moment is looking at how we can create more efficient tidal range schemes by looking at bi-directional turbines and symmetric, very low head turbines. So uh, John, Roger's already mentioned the Jacobs uh, Innovate UK Smart Grants, and that's testing the bi-directional turbine. And there's also the Tidetech Turbine Solution, which is looking at a rotating turret turbine. So these are key innovations to help us get better efficiencies out of tidal range, which will again, make us more competitive with other generation technologies and give us a lower co levelized cost of energy. So how do we actually create this industry that will help us deploy uh, the potential of tidal range? Well, UK government issued a British energy security strategy back in 2022, where they committed to aggressively explore tidal range technology as a source of energy security. However, since that publication, there's been very little uh, forward thinking on what that actually means. We did have a publication in December 2023 uh, of, from the Department of Energy Security and Net Zero on tidal range projects, criteria and how to submit a proposal. But again, subsequently, we've not had any further steps forward. So <clears throat> a big part of what we do at the Tidal Range Alliance is lobby government in, to give them policy solutions that can help unlock the industry. And we suggested they can do this in four ways. First of all, they can look at working with industry to help understand what are the barriers to unlock tidal range. So they could call, uh, call for, uh, do a call for evidence 
uh, which would address, uh, which would invite industry to respond and look at why, what are the barriers and how we can circumvent those barriers. Government could help set up a strategic task force, um, which would emulate the one that was set up for offshore wind uh, in 2012, which has been really successful in helping the proliferation of offshore wind. Government could help enable and create a route map and industrial strategy for accelerated deployment. And they could also help enable that key price stabilization mechanism that will support long-term energy generation and really offer that uh, investor confidence, which is really key in bringing down the cost of capital. So a price stabilization mechanism is really fundamental um, in this volatile energy market to give us, um, give us that investor confidence and allow that to development to take place. So in the UK, we already have contracts of difference. And this is really around short-term projects, which have an operating life of less than 13 years. And the contracts for difference is a 15 year contract. So it isn't particularly suitable for projects that are over 50 years. Um, so therefore we need a different type of financing mechanism, which the government recognize and have used a different mechanism for nuclear projects. Um, Contracts for difference, as I say, 15 year period, which wind and solar is typically, it's typically 60% of their lifespan. Whereas if we had a contract for difference for 80 years, there'd be no long-term value after the 35 years due to the private sector hurdle rates. So we need a longer term financing methodology. And what we're suggesting government look at is the long-term financing methodology, such as the regulated asset base. And this focuses only on costs and securing advance payments from electricity consumers based on the asset value of the project during construction. So it's minimizing financing costs rather than energy costs. And this advance payment effectively offsets compounding of interest, thereby reducing the financing costs over time. And a green book analysis, which I should just quote, this is from Peter Kidd from WSP, and I saw Peter come in, so thank you for your work on this, Peter. Uh, a green book analysis uh, at the social discount rate shows the benefits of the advance payment to the consumer compared with more traditional financing costs. And energy from tidal range is almost constant in annual terms. So the value will increase with rate of energy inflation with only very small cost inflation over its lifetime. It's also worth noting that in the UK, the industry has successfully lobbied for a cap and floor price stabilization mechanism to bring forward pump storage hydro, and this should come into effect in 2025. So in summary, in terms of price stabilization mechanisms, we're asking government to help enable a regulated asset base, and we're comparing this to infrastructure projects like nuclear and the Thames Tideway Tunnel. And this would also require um, regulator and specific legislation, so both primary and secondary legislation, but would ensure long term value and reduce cost for consumers. It's also a really effective mechanism to capture co benefits, such as flood defence benefits, which would provide a comprehensive approach to project valuation. But however, we should also undertake work to review the impact on household bills. And there was a methodology that was set up by uh, Department of Business Energy and Industrial Strategy um, that looked at the impact of size while seeing nuclear from the regulated asset, ba the, um, asset base on consumer bills. So in summary, what government strategic support do we need? Well, government support and ownership, the role of the government is crucial um, with the potential involvement of government funds like GB Energy, which uh, Labour is putting forward, or even a sovereign fund, or the potential for government guarantee to buy back assets. We need to have innovation incentives. So the importance of incentivizing innovation and considering the UK's opportunity to export solutions. So this could be seed funding, an accelerator fund, uh, and a focus on exporting clean infrastructure solutions. Government has to be able to collaborate with industry. We've got to engage the big energy companies, so Centrica, EDF, RWE, and BP, and explore their preferences or potentially negotiating bilateral deals. 
We've also got to think about geographical sequencing and have a regional strategy for tidal range projects, considering different ge geographical locations and sequencing based on regional characteristics. So our summary of tidal range asks are we want the government to commit to tidal range power being an essential part of the UK energy mix going forward. And really we're wanting to get a ministerial statement of support. We want the government to issue a call for evidence that would put forward to industry a response required, looking at and understanding the barriers to the deployment of tidal range. We need to have more resource within the government. Currently, there's only one full time equivalent employee looking at tidal range. Uh, with such great potential, um, this really needs to be scaled up in terms of resource. We want government to create an industry task force similar to offshore wind to really deeply consider the RAP mechanism that could bring forward tidal range and give that investor confidence. We want a roadmap to accelerate tidal range. We want an industrial strategy to make sure that we are onshoring as much of the supply chain and jobs and skills within the UK to bring those direct and indirect jobs to areas that really need them. We want to build on the work that's already been done. As Roger mentioned, there's a real history of and a huge amount of wealth of knowledge uh, that we need to build on to push forward our argument for tidal range. And we want to be able to test uh, and innovate as well and consider those regional strategic um, tidal range projects in those different geographic locations. So the aspiration is that tidal range can travel in the slipstream of pump storage hydro. Pump storage hydro, like tidal range, are bespoke large infrastructure projects, multi-billion and intergenerational assets. We've got some really good traction with pump storage hydro, and it's not a big leap of faith for government to now be able to consider tidal range. So in conclusion, we're pushing really hard for the opportunity of tidal range to become the cornerstone of a decarbonised grid fit for the future in the UK. It's timetabled energy generation, it's next to sense the population demand, and it can circumvent some of the really big barriers we've got in terms of transmission constraints. It's an internet intergenerational asset, and we know from hydropower, value is still there after 100 years. You know, that 1.1 billion that the hydropower portfolio offered to consumers in that 2022 year of energy crisis. It's all about having a resilient energy system with the interdependencies that we have within banking, communications, electricity and a good, reliable, stable supply of electricity is key to a functioning society. But we've got a lot of challenges and the main challenge we have is political will. These are large infrastructure projects and they can be seen as a political hot potato, uh, which we've seen in the UK with high speed to rail project. And, all, and also Hinkley C Nuclear, uh, both are over budget and over running time-wise as well. Government really like modular solutions where they can see costs coming down, and that's why they are very favorable towards tidal stream, but we need to reassert that tidal range is modular. It's large, but it's modular. We also have a challenge insofar as there aren't very many engineers or scientists within the civil service and in politicians as well. About 9% of civil servants have a science, technology, engineering, maths background. And the energy transition is a really complex engineering and social problem. So we need to have more people in civil service that understand how the engineering system works. However, as we continue to decarbonize, the easy wins have been picked off and these easy wins will dissipate and the harder to deliver projects will become a necessity. So I do believe that tidal range is uh, coming. Uh, tidal range time is coming. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Miss uh, Kat. Uh, we have a very informative uh, presentation by you, and also uh, especially on the last page, uh, this is quite interesting. You have summarized all the opportunity and also the challenges that we have faced, especially in the tidal range energy in UK, where this experience can be shared, especially to other parts of the world, 
uh, we have uh, participants for all over the world. Today, I can see uh, many familiar uh, names and also uh, colleagues from other parts of the country, from Malaysia, China, India, uh, UK, and uh, Australia, and we have many, many more. So we have many questions uh, in the list here. So I will just read out one by one. But before that, also, I will just want to summarize from this uh, presentation by both <coughs> speakers just now. Uh, basically, we can understand and also the, the, the operation of practices of coastal tidal range energy developments, as well as uh, this will contribute to the technologies for the sustainable coastal and assurance developments. And uh, we have managed to explore some important uh, benefit and also the factors, uh, especially on the environmental ecology aspect for the coastal impairments, especially also on the net zero policy. So I will read out one by one the questions uh, that have been raised here. Uh, we have a first question for Professor Roger Falconer. Uh, what is the efficiency uh, reasons? Is there any minimum of tidal uh, range for, or for the tidal turbines? So this is a question from one of the participants here. Roger, do you want to answer or we want to have more questions? Then later on you can, yes. In terms of efficiency, um, it's not just simply the tidal range. For example, if you, you've, you've got to consider the square of the tidal range and the plant surface area. So if you've got a small plant surface area, for example, Swansea Bay Lagoon has quite a high tidal range. I'm not sure exactly offhand what it is, but it's about 10 metres, probably slightly more under spring tide conditions. But the plant surface area was only 11 square kilometres. So the cost of energy for Swansea Bay Lagoon, although it was a pilot or proposed as a pilot, is, is quite expensive. In contrast, for example, I showed you West Somerset Lagoon, that's 80 square kilometers, that's eight times as large. The tidal range is also slightly bigger. In answering your question, in general terms, I would say you'd be looking for a tidal range of five meters or more to make it financially viable. Although there are proposals, for example, in Malaysia, I've seen papers recently where we're talking in terms of tidal ranges of less than five meters. And the tidal range schemes offer other opportunities as well. So you might build a scheme primarily for flood defense or minimize coastal erosion and as a byproduct produced energy. So the main purpose of that project might be to produce uh, flood defense rather than tidal energy. So it's difficult to answer your question specifically, but I would say as a ballpark figure, I'd be looking at minimum of five meters for a, for a cost effective tidal range scheme. Thank you, Roger. I think uh, these have answered the questions for our first uh, participant here. So we have the other questions uh, from uh, Dong Fang. I think uh, it's our colleague also from uh, Cambridge University. Uh, are there any tidal lagoon uh, which have been built in UK or any part of the world? Well, maybe uh, one of you can answer this question, please. There are schemes in the UK which would be similar to tidal, tidal lagoons or tidal barrages. There's the Karu Mill scheme in, in um, in Pembroke, for example, it was built in the 18th century, maybe 19th, 18th century. So there are small schemes. There are schemes. There are quite a few schemes in Malay, in um, Korea. Um, in terms of lagoons, I'm not sure of any specific lagoons, but it's difficult to differentiate between a lagoon and a barrage, other than the one spans the reservoir and the other doesn't. So there are schemes, but none that have been built recently and tested, other than Laurence. Well, Laurence is a barrage, I suppose. Okay, thank you, Roger. So we have uh, the other interesting topic uh, and also questions here, where I think everyone is looking at the intelligence, uh, uh, artificial intelligence, where this question is uh, asking, what do you know about the use of the artificial intelligence, especially in uh, electricity production, as well as on the tidal range uh, energies, and um, maybe uh, any one of you are interested to answer this question, please. Well, you. this you could spend all day answering this question. Artificial yeah, intelligence offers enormous that. opportunities yeah. for the future. Uh, you mentioned wastewater treatment. Let, let me just give you one example here, uh, if I can, and I'll be as brief as possible. If you look at um, disinfection, for example, you want to get the balance right. It's a bit like medication for health attacks, uh, heart attacks and so forth. If you overprescribe, you have problems. If you underprescribe, you end up with a heart attack. So if you have too much um, disinfection 
for the flow through a contact tank, you will uh, possibly lead to um, various carcinogenic threats in uh, halomethanes and so forth. If you under disinfect, then you have other health problems. It's very difficult to do that with simply using CFD, computational fluid dynamics alone. Artificial intelligence offers you huge opportunities to optimize the dosage rate as, as you use water through the water supply system. So that's just one of many examples where our artificial intelligence is going to offer us huge opportunities in the future, including the operation of tidal range schemes. We can uh, optimize the operation between spring and neap cycles, similarly for tidal, tidal uh, stream energy, and we could get more energy out of the system than without the use of artificial intelligence. Can, can I just add in there as well? I think just in terms of artificial intelligence more generally as well, we've got to think about our smart grids and how they're going to be functioning in the future. Um, so actually, when we think about um, smart local energy systems, and the ability for generation to be, you know, ele electrons to be moved where they're needed most, um, especially next to those cities as we move to heat pumps, smart water cylinders, EV, vehicle to grid. So, I, you know, I think AI is going to have a huge uh, role to play in the most efficient grid system that we will hopefully have in the future. Yeah, thank you, Kate. Uh, I, we have one more question for Kate here. Yeah how we deal with the navigation function, especially for uh, actuary or channel with the tidal turbine here. Uh, I might have to pass that on to Roger because I think he's the yeah, engineer. I think this is very technical, or... right? Yeah. What was the question? Sorry. Yeah, this question is about the navigation functions of the actuary or channel with the tidal turbines here. I suppose it... That's a difficult one to answer. It depends on the estuary, it depends on the sediment, the sediment characteristics on the bed, and it depends on the level of suspended sediments with particularly spring tides. Um, presumably, the, the point that's been raised is that the morphology will change, and that might affect uh, shipping. I'm not quite sure what the question is, really. But the answer okay. to that is that would be that would be need to be addressed in detailed. Uh, hydromorphological modeling. So you would need to do detailed computational studies to work out what the impact of a barrage or a lagoon would be on the bed characteristics. And you would only know the answer to that when you've done those modeling studies. Yeah, okay. But I'm trying to understand the question here. Maybe uh, this is about how the tidal turbine can affect uh, the navigations, especially. Uh, Maybe well, you wouldn't just, put you wouldn't yeah. ideally put a tidal turbine. I, I presume this question yeah. relates more than to tidal stream turbines. Okay. You wouldn't be wanting yeah. to rush into putting tidal stream turbines in navigation channels. Okay, maybe I invite the participant to uh, write more details about the questions here. Okay, so uh, we have also the, some questions here. Uh, but anyway, they're asking about any tips for uh, bidding a startup of this industry, uh, and also they are quite interested on to looking into this uh, new industry here. But anyway, this is a little, a little bit of a promotion. So I think you put in the linking and uh, others. If you want to answer these questions here, then maybe uh, welcome. I think I think what one of one of the, the key points today is we can connect so much more easily across Teams and Zoom. So just use the networks that are already in place and also look out for innovation grants. Uh, you know, we're quite lucky in the UK that we have quite a lot of innovation grants. As Roger already mentioned, we have the smart grant, which Jacobs is using to bring forward the very low head turbine, tidal turbine. Um, so, but yeah, use the information that's out there and use the networks that are out there and learn from others. Okay, yeah, that's great. I, I have listened to your presentation just now. I, I can understand that everyone have their roles, as not only the governments. So uh, there's one, questions here direct to uh, I'm not sure maybe one of you how can the governments and private sectors investor uh, can collaborate to overcome the high initial costs associated with the tidal energy projects here so um, I, I think I think the key here is that government have a really big role in creating that stable price mechanism that that long-term price stabilization um, environment, but also offering that seed funding and also yeah. using their investment to lever other private investment. 
Um, so we'll, we'll, we've got a new government coming uh, for well, election 4th of July. So we'll see what our, uh, the landscape looks like then. But as I mentioned, Labour have got plans for GB Energy, which is set to do that. It's, it's hopefully going to use their government funding to leave a private investment um, and help to de-risk as well. Okay, that's great. I think we have running out of time. It's uh, about 5 p.m. now in Malaysia, but I think it's about uh, 10 a.m. in uh, uh, your times in UK. So uh, we still have uh, quite many questions here. If you have more questions to ask, uh, you can actually send an email to the speakers and also uh, through the ILWA. And you can visit our website here to get more uh, information. And for upcoming IW webinar and also the events, uh, you can also refer to our website under the IWA networks. And we have the World Congress, which is coming soon in Toronto, Canada on this August. Uh, please refer to this uh, website also. Uh, we are not going to answer any questions after this. Uh, I see you can see more questions coming in. But anyway, please join our network, especially to join our special group here. Uh, we are together, we can make difference for the world. So I can see that uh, each of us, especially uh, every one of us have playing uh, important roles, not only the governments, the government can provide us with the seed fund, and but the expert, especially you and me, we can work together to come up with something for the world. Thank you very much to all of you. I look forward to, uh, uh, to join you for the next webinar together with our IWA specialist group here on sustainable coastal and estuarine developments. Thank you and goodbye. Uh, have a nice day. Bye bye. Thank you to the both speaker again. Bye. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.